morning chat and thank you everyone for taking the time out to be in the front on the Sunday morning service to worship him, to give thanks to him, <clears throat> to glorify his great name. The topic of today's sermon would be God's great reversal, something that takes us back to a time. My wife always tells me that she would like to go to a time where she had the best of her days in her life. Maybe to a time when she was young, where she didn't have worries or anything to do about, but a time where all of us imagined in our own lives where it was the happiest days of our lives. And, and if she could go there in her imagination and <clears throat> spend that moment there and be happy and take all the right decisions so that she can be happy now also in this time. She always talks about this time of going back, reversing time back and being at a time where she was the happiest. Yes, God also has started something that he would want us to take back all of us to a time where there's a good relationship between God and man. <clears throat> How God operates in this world ups upsets our human expectations. We human beings often project our human tendencies with punitive anger that is intended for punishment uh, in a conditional exchange for obedience. And we think that God is on our side and he <coughs> wants, and we want God to punish those who are there, who are against us. This is the human tendencies that we uh, tend to carry with us in our thoughts. Always forgetting that God is a great creator a God of great love, a God of great mercy and solidarity. We always think of a time where, you know, how we can take revenge. That is the tendency, the culture, the nature that is existing in our human mind. But unlike this, God, how he operates in the world is quite different than what we humans think. In John chapter 3, verse 16, where everyone is familiar, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, <coughs> that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. God did not send his son into this world to condemn the world, where it is quite against what we think in our minds. We always try to condemn the people around us, but he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to save the world through him. King David also understood how bad our human nature is, how deceitful our human nature is, how wicked we are. And in Psalms 36, <coughs> 1 to 6, it reads on like this. I have a message from God in my heart concerning the sinfulness of the wicked. There is no fear of God before their eyes. David, King David begins to recognize that our human nature is so wicked and it is against the very nature of God. In their own eyes, verse 2, they flatter themselves too much to detect or hate their sin. The words of their mouths are wicked and deceitful. They fail to act wisely or do good. Even on their beds, they plot evil. That is, our minds are so corrupted, even while we are at rest, we only plan to do evil. They commit themselves to sinful course <coughs> and, do not, and do not reject what is wrong. But he also begins to recognize, King David, that God's love is so great. And in verse 5, it says, O oh Lord, your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness to skies. 
Your righteousness is like the highest mountains. Your justice like the great deep. You, Lord, both people and animal. God, in love towards us as human beings, is so enormous. Just like we standing at the foot of the mountain, looking at the highest mountain, it's so big, much more you can imagine, <coughs> much more than the sky is above. That is his great love towards each and every one of us. And look at the love that God has. He not only does preserve us as people, but he also preserves the animals. That's what is written in Psalms chapter 36 verse 6. God wants to have a time that is in harmony with him right from the beginning, right at the beginning when God created Adam and Eve, when a time there was where we existed without sin. But down the line, you all know the story, how we have fallen down and how we have uh, become sinful in nature. And in Isaiah, verse, Isaiah chapter 62, verse five, 1 to 5, it says, God is going to take all actions, all kinds of measures to cleanse us from the blame that we have. To summarize Isaiah 62, verse 1 to 5 says, He will not rest until the people are vindicated and restored to their glory, regardless of what they may deserve. Vindication means an action of cleansing someone's blame. God promises that he will not rest till he cleanses us of the blame that we have and he will restore us to the glory that once we had, that we had a beautiful <coughs> relationship with him. Just like the video that we saw, God has given different people different kinds of blessings different kinds of gifts, different kinds of abilities that help us to grow so that we are transformed from within, so that we are becoming more like the nature that God wants us to have. For the scripture that today we are going to take, I'm going to Read, read the first miracle that Jesus Christ has done. Uh, the miracle where he has performed in the land of Cana, where he has uh, turned the water into wine. Let's see what lessons we can learn from this particular miracle that God performed in the land of Cana. This story is in the book of John, chapter 2, beginning from verse 1 to 11. On the third day after Jesus was uh, baptized, uh, he was invited to a wedding uh, in the land of Cana. Cana was a, a small town and it didn't have a lot of population. It was a poor place. He was invited to this festival uh, to this wedding where his mother also joined and she was well ahead of Jesus arrival into the wedding because the bridegroom's mother and father were a good friend of Mary and she went there to help them out. Now on the wedding day, on the very first day I guess, uh, the bridegroom's parents have took a lot of pain in preparing for the wedding feast. The culture then that existed was or is of hospitality, of extending <coughs> hospitality. The culture was well knit, a family based culture with uh, a close knit of brothers, sisters. Uh, brothers, children, cousins, uncles and aunts. And a wedding in that culture was a very important a ceremony 
during those days. And I'm sure the bridegroom's parents would have taken utmost care, uh, care in providing the best for the bridegroom and the bride and do their best to <coughs> uh, make the wedding celebration a grand success. Just like today, we take all the efforts to uh, make sure that the wedding meal is banquet is well prepared and satisfies all the guests that we have invited. And it was customary then to serve wine in the wedding uh, banquet. So on the very first day when all of them were invited, uh, apparently the wine that they had procured, and all of you all know the story very well of how Jesus has uh, turned water into wine. During those days, hospitality was so important in that culture that it would have been a shame for the bride's parents if they have uh, not served sufficient amount of wine. And it was also a culture then that during the time, the festivities would not only go on for a day, it would also go on as long as a week. As much as uh, the groom's family can afford. And it was also a culture then that those who were invited would also bring in their own food and drink also then. But when everything is provided free, and it's in the wedding feast. Why would anybody bring just like nowadays? If you're invited for a wedding, you would not take your own food or drink and go there. You would expect something that the, that the host would serve you. Just like that, all of them arrived. They had a good time. And in the middle of the banquet, the wine was over. And there was a sense of what they call uh, chaos in the bridegroom's family. What should I do? What should I do? What should I do? The wine is over and the guests are asking for more of it. By this time, a lot of guests who have arrived for the wedding have enjoyed a good a drink of the wine and really they enjoy the hospitality what the bride and the bridegroom had provided for them. But when the wine was over, they were a bit scared. Now, this was noticed by Jesus' mother, Mary, and she had asked Jesus, the wine is over. She had confidence on her son, Jesus. Till then, Jesus has not performed any miracles. During those days, it was customary for people who come for a wedding, to wash their feet and get into the house. Like that, there were about six jars that were there to wash people's feet. When Jesus' mother came around and told him, this is the situation. Not all of them know in the banquet that the wine is over, except for a few, the bride's parents, Jesus' mother, and a couple of them, <coughs> and especially the Master of the banquets knew that the wine was over. And you know the story how Jesus asked the servants to fill all these six jars full of water and prayed over it. And God miraculously converted the water into wine. It's a miracle that God performed them. Until then, they have tasted the wine first, and they have enjoyed it. When this water was converted as wine, Jesus asked one of the servants to draw and go show it to the master of the banquets. The person who was in charge of the entire arrangements, he asked him to show this wine to them. The person drank it and said, I have been to so many weddings. I have been to so many weddings and organized things. But never did I see that you serving the best wine 
last and the bad wine first. He was surprised that the wine that was served earlier was not as good as the wine that was offered to him now. Yes, the hospitality that was shown before was excellent according to the culture that was existing then. But when this particular wine was served, he was surprised to see the quality, taste the quality that it was much, much, much better than what it was. And he said, this is the best wedding I have attended. See, what is that we can learn from this particular thing is our hospitality that we extend towards others is not to the standard that God offers hospitality. The wine that was served later satisfied all of them much more than what they were satisfied before. It fulfilled their expectations. Normally in such banquets, they serve some wine, which is good initially. And when everybody's a bit, they serve the bad wine. But here, here the best wine is served at the end. And they were expecting something else, but they got something else. Here, the hospitality that we show according to the culture is not sufficient or not to the standard that God shows. God, hospitality is much higher than what we think. Where he invites us lovingly into his care and gives us <coughs> that confidence, the abundance of hospitality in him. And the second point that there that I can see is Jesus' action shows us a lot of grace in this particular event. Not only was Jesus God incarnate, but he was also <clears throat> grace incarnate. His miracles, his signs, were not just to benefit the people involved, but rather to show the lavish kindness God bestows on his creation. One of the scholars by name, uh, Carolyn Lewis said, we can see the uh, abundance of grace in Jesus once Jesus became flesh. The rest of the gospel shows us what grace tastes like what grace looks like, what grace sounds like, and what grace feels like. The six water pots were estimated to be about 20 to 30 gallons each, filled with water that was changed into the best wine, 20 to 30 gallons. Each gallon is about 3.7 liters. When you compare 30 gallons, it's about 110 liters per jar. Now, six jars, it's almost like 600 liters of wine that the abundance of grace that God has bestowed on that wedding couple, that, that particular wedding feast, where it could serve them the entire week. But the best wine was served later. When the guests were less observant, the cheaper wine was introduced, but not in this case. Isn't it that how abundant grace works? You were expecting something cheaper to come after what was served earlier. But in this case, the best came out. You must be expecting that the experience that Jesus' abundant grace is the experience that God gives us so lavishly in our lives that we can easily forget these experiences if we are not observant. When we do certain things in our lives, we expect something as a result to come out. Maybe a result that we are expecting out of it. But God has something better in for us where 
through his grace, he showers us more blessing, a spontaneous gift from God, a gracious gift from God, a generous gift from God, where his favor rests upon us and he blesses us more abundantly than what we actually expect. The term marriage in those days uh, was a union, a bond between two individuals. And when we take the point of marriage as a metaphor, here we can see that God wants to bond humans and himself with us. Here, where he is bonding the relationship that broke in the Garden of Eden to be joined together as one. And in the celebration, in Joel 3, 18 and Amos 9, 11 and 15 and Hosea 2, 14 and to 23, where it says a celebration ends with something to rejoice. It ends a restoration, a point where wine is served, as it is written in the scriptures. God wants us wants to establish this union back with human beings. He wants to bond back with the human beings. So we see here that with the first miracle that Jesus has done, he has shown hospitality that God shows towards us. He has shown his grace by providing abundant and abundant. And he has use the concept of marriage where we are bonded back to him. It's like taking us back to him, where he's reversing what he has, what we have gone through from the time we have been in sin. God is trying to reverse the process of building us, bringing us back to a place where we are in good relationship with him before sin entered the world. In the Jewish culture, uh, Jewish culture where, you know, there are so many rules and regulations that are there that exclude people out of their uh, place. Uh, it's about holiness, it's about purity, it's about the laws that they have to follow. And you know, and those that don't follow these laws are like expelled, are out. Just like the Samaritan woman at the well. They were expelled, they were not allowed to worship at the temple in Jerusalem. Just like the woman who was caught in adultery just like the man who was possessed with demons, he was put in the graveyard. Jesus, Jesus chose to spend time with such people to a point where he was accused of being a glutton and a drunkard. Jesus wanted his first, if Jesus wanted his first sign to be noticed, he could have presented this particular miracle to the bride and the bridegroom or the parents of the bridegroom. But he did not do it. He instead asked the servants who filled the jars to take the wine to the, to the master of the banquets and show it to him. He didn't Pray for attention then. The miracle that Jesus performed was only noticed by the servants first. Only they knew from where this particular wine came because they were the ones who were involved in filling up those jars. And they were the first ones to see the glimpse of God in their lives. But 
we as human beings always tend to go according to the culture that we, the world is going through. But God is not moving in the way that the world moves across. God is moving in a way that restores us back to him, that reverses back the entire time. Just like my wife thinks she would like to go to a time where she would be happy in her childhood days, to a time where she had the best of the time. God wants the best in each and every one of us. That's why God started this process of reversal with the first miracle that Jesus has performed. Jesus was first invited to the wedding. Jesus was first told about the problem. Jesus was allowed and asked to perform a miracle and the people around enjoyed it. Now, the experiences that we have this world are quite different. We always tend to be on the side the culture takes. We always try to favor people who are well clothed, who are equal to our society, who are equal to us. And we differentiate between the categories of people and discriminate the poor and we favor the rich. Most cultural norms are constructed like this. But God is a person who does not value people. He is a person who treats and loves everybody equally. That is why, as we saw in the video, that God in his own time blesses everyone with the spiritual gifts that he gives. He uses his gifts to everyone. He gives his gifts to everyone, whoever he chooses, whatever time he chooses, whatever place he chooses, so that we are benefited from those gifts and we help each other to grow in the very nature of God. With the abundant graces that God has provided us, what can we learn from the experiences that we have seen in the very first uh, miracle that God has performed? It's easy to over overlook minor blessings that come our way. You and I know what we're talking about. When our hands are full and trying to open a door, a stranger comes and tries to open the door for us. Or when we are tired or when we are busy, uh, uh, someone comes to help, sir, help us out, which sometimes is a coincidence. Or when we are sick and when we are not feeling in the best of our moods, suddenly a friend comes and gives a visit to childhood finish, which brings us joy and rejuvenates our spirit. Sometimes most of us, all, all of us have a car when we are tired, sick and all. Suddenly we get a small parking place close to the door where we have to go and how lucky we are we feel. It's also a blessing that God showers his graces on us like this. If we don't notice the small things in our life, we sometimes miss his loving graces that he showers on each and every one of us. We might think it's a coincidence that is happening, but God in his great mercy is showing his grace on each and every one of us. You and I are very uniquely made and very precious in the sight of God. He does things in such a manner that we are drawn back to him into a relationship. That is why it said, whatever things happen, it is for our good. That God does things for our good so that we may not see it at that particular time, but at a later time, God does things that will bring us back close to him. We often tend to discriminate people. It's human nature to graduate towards those who look, think similarly. It's easy to think highly of those that culture 
and has esteemed others worthy of each other. When God doesn't show any difference between loving people, why is that that we show differences in loving people? When you have an opportunity to lift people up, like especially those people who are who are less fortunate, who are less privileged, the orphan children, the widows, the people who are suffering with various kinds of diseases, children who are imprisoned with, with parents who are imprisoned and don't have anybody to look at, look for them. Let's look out for such opportunities to bring those people up to invite those people, to lift them up, to give them opportunities where we show God's grace to them. Take opportunities that will help to show God's grace to these people who are less fortunate. God's great reversal, brethren, is to bring us back to a time, a, a place where we have the best of God and best of us in relationship with each other. God wants us to have a loving relationship with him where we are in a time where we, our, our internal being is transformed to the way that God wants us to be, to build that relationship. Just like the first miracle, Jesus was invited, let us invite Jesus Christ into our lives. And let us tell him the problems that we have. That is, we are asking God to help us out and allow Jesus Christ to perform the miracle of performing the miracle of water turning into it. Allow God to work in us and enjoy the benefits of this particular miracle in our lives. Brethren, God has a plan of reversal so that we are restored back to our glory with him in a time where we can have the best of best of uh, the relationship that we can enjoy with God. May God bless us with his spirit and help us understand that God has a plan for each and every one of us and that we participate in this plan. Invite him, allow him, and enjoy the blessing that he gives us so that we are transformed into a person that he wants us to be. Thank you.